Okay, so welcome to lesson 14, the final lesson um, for now. And you know, we'll talk at the end about like what next. Um, but as you can see from what's increasingly been happening, what next is very much about you with us rather than us leading you or telling you. So, um, you know, we're a community now and we can figure these stuff out together. And obviously, USF is a wonderful ally to have. Um, um, yeah, so for now, this is the last of these lessons. Um, and uh, one of the things that was great to see this week was this um, terrific uh, article in, in Forbes um, that talked about um, deep learning education, and it was written by one of our terrific students, Maria. Um, and uh, uh, focuses on the great work of some of the students um, that have come through this course. And um, yeah, so I wanted to say um, thank you very much and congratulations on this great article. I hope uh, everybody will check it out. Um, it's really beautifully written as well and, and terrific stories. I, I found it quite inspiring. Um, So today we are going to be talking about um, a couple of things, but we're going to start with um, kind of time series and structured data. Um, and time series, I wanted to start very briefly by talking about something which I think you basically know how to do. Um, this is a fantastic paper um, because it is not by DeepMind, um, nobody's heard of it. Um, it actually comes from the uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and believe it or not, um, perhaps the, the, the epicenter of practical applied um, AI in medicine today is in Southern California, and specifically Southern California Pediatrics, the Children's Hospital of Orange County Choc, and uh, the Children's Hospital of uh, Los Angeles CHLA. Um, CHLA, uh, which, which this paper comes from, actually has this um, thing they call VPICU, the Virtual Pediatric uh, Intensive Care Unit, where for many, many years they've been tracking every electronic signal uh, about how um, every patient, every kid in the hospital was treated and what all their uh, ongoing kind of sensor readings are. Um, and <clears throat> one of the extraordinary things they do is when the, when the doctors there do rounds, Data scientists come with them. Uh, like I don't know anywhere in the world else in the world that this this happens. Um, and so a um, uh, couple of months ago, uh, they released a draft of this um, amazing paper where they talked about how they um, pulled out all this uh, data from the EMR and from the sensors and attempted to predict um, patient mortality. Now the reason this is interesting is that when a kid goes into the ICU. Um, if, if a model starts saying this kid's looking like they might die, then that's, that's the thing that sets the alarms going and everybody rushes over and starts you know, looking after them. Um, and they found that they built a model that was more accurate than any existing model. And those existing models were built on many years of deep clinical input, um, and they used an RNN. Now, um, this kind of um, time series data um, is, is what I'm going to refer to as a signal type time series data. So let's say you've got a, a series of like um, um, blood pressure readings, right? So they might be, you know, they come in and their blood pressure is kind of low and it's kind of all over the place and then suddenly it shoots up, right? The, um, and then, you know, in addition to that, maybe there's uh, other readings such as like, um, um, you know, uh, at which points they receive some kind of uh, medical intervention, you know, there was one here and one here, and then there was like six here, um, and so forth. So these kinds of things, generally speaking, the, the state of health at time t is probably best predicted by all of the various sensor readings at t minus 1 and t minus 2 and t minus 3, right? So in, in statistical terms, we would refer to that as autocorrelation. Autocorrelation means correlation with previous time periods, right? Um, and for this kind of signal, um, I think it's very likely that an RNN um, is the way to go. Um, obviously, you could probably get a, 
better result using a bidirectional RNN, but that's not going to be any help in the ICU because you don't have the future time period sensors, right? So um, be careful of this uh, data leakage issue. Um, and indeed, this is what uh, this team um, at uh, the VPICU at uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles did. They used an RNN to get this data of the art result. Um, I'm not really going to teach you more about this because basically you already know how to do it. Okay, there's, there's rough, there's, um, you can check out the paper, you'll see there's almost nothing special. The only thing which was um, quite clever was that their, um, their sensor readings were not necessarily equally spaced. So, for example, you know, um, did they uh, receive some particular medical intervention? Clearly they're very widely spaced and they're not um, equally spaced. So rather than um, having the RNN um, have basically a sequence of um, interventions that gets fed to the RNN, instead they actually have two things. One is the, the signal, and the other is the time since the last signal was read. So each point at the RNN, if you, the RNN is basically just some function f, it's receiving two things. It's receiving the signal at time t, and the value of t itself, right? What is the time? Or the difference in time, what, how long was it since the last one? Right? Um, but that doesn't require any different deep learning, um, that's just concatenating one extra thing onto your vector. And they actually show kind of mathematically that this makes a certain amount of sense um, as a way to deal with this, and then they find empirically that it does actually seem to work pretty well. Okay, so. Um, I can't tell you whether this is state-of-the-art for anything, because I just haven't seen you know, deep comparative papers or any competitions or anything that really have this kind of data, um, which is weird, because a lot of the world runs on this kind of data, this kind of data doing it effectively things with it is super valuable, like you know, if you're an oil and gas company, what's the drill head telling you, or what's the you know, signals coming out of the pipe telling you, or so on and so forth. But, you know, there we go. It's um, not the kind of cool thing that uh, the Google kids work on, so who knows. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to talk more about that. That's how you can do time series with this kind of signal data. Um, you can also incorporate uh, all of the other stuff we're about to talk about, um, which is the other kind of time series data. Um, for example, um, there was a Kaggle competition um, which was looking at forecasting um, uh, sales. Well, wow, how does that happen? Um, forecasting um, yeah. sales using um, uh, for each store at this big company in Europe called Rossman, um, based on you know the, the the date and what promotions are going on and what the competitors are doing and so forth. <laughs> um, this kind of data is likely to look like um, kind of this. It's likely to kind of be, you know, some kind of something like that, or maybe it'll have, um, oops, um, or maybe it'll have some kind of uh, trend to it. Okay, um, so these kinds of uh, uh, seasonal type time series uh, are very widely um, uh, analyzed by um, econometricians, um, and they're, they're everywhere, particularly in business, um, if you're trying to predict um, you know, how many widgets you have to buy next month, um, or you know, whether to increase or decrease your prices, or um, you know, all kinds of operational type things tend to look like this. Um, you know uh, how uh, full your planes are going to be. You know um, what, whether you should add promotions, so on and so forth. So um, it turns out that the state of the art for this kind of approach is not necessarily um, to use an RNN. Um, and I'm actually going to look at the third place result um, from this competition because the third place result. Um, was nearly as good as places one and two, but way, 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 way simpler. Um, and also turns out that there's stuff that we can build on top of for almost every model of this kind. Um, and basically, surprise, surprise, it turns out 
that the answer is to use a neural network. So, you know, I need to warn you again, um, what I'm going to teach you here is very, very uncool. Um, uh, you'll never read about it from DeepMind or OpenAI. Um, it doesn't involve any robot arms. It doesn't involve thousands of GPUs. Um, um, it's the kind of boring stuff that normal companies use to like m make more money or spend less money or satisfy their customers. Um, so I, I, I apologize deeply for that oversight. Um, having said that, in the uh, 25 years more, I've been doing, you know, machine learning work applied in the real world. 98 percent of it has been this kind of data. Um, uh, whether it be when I was working in, in um, agriculture, I've worked in wool, macadamia nuts, and rice, and we were figuring out, you know, um, how, uh, how full our barrels were going to be, whether we needed more, we were figuring out, you know, um, how to set futures markets prices we, uh, for um, agricultural goods, whatever. Worked in mining and brewing, which, you know, required analyzing all kinds of engineering data and uh, uh, sales data. Um, I've worked in banking that required looking at kind of transaction account pricing and, uh, and uh, risk and fraud. All of these areas basically involve this kind of data. Um, so I think um, although like no one publishes stuff about this because you know um, anybody who comes out of a Stanford PhD and goes to Google doesn't know about any of those things, I guess, um, it's probably the most useful. Uh, thing for the vast majority of people. <coughs> um, and you know, excitingly, it turns out that um, you don't need to learn any new techniques at all. Um, in fact, the model um, that um, they got uh, this third place result with, a um, very, very simple model, um, is basically one where each different categorical variable um, was uh, one-hot encoded um, and chucked into an embedding layer. The embedding layers were concatenated and chucked through a dense layer, and then a second dense layer, and then through, went through a sigmoid function into an output layer. So, <coughs> um, very simple. Um, the continuous variables they haven't uh, drawn here, and these, um, these, all these pictures are going to come straight from this paper, which these two, uh, the folks that came third kindly actually wrote a paper about this. Um, the continuous variables basically get fed directly into the dense layer. Okay. So that's that's the structure of the model. Um, how well does it work? So the short answer is um, compared to k nearest neighbors, random forests, and GBMs, um, just a base, a, a simple neural network um, beats all of those approaches, um, just with standard kind of one-hot encoding, whatever. Um, but then the uh, EE is um, entity embeddings. So adding in this uh, idea of using embeddings, interestingly, you can take the embeddings trained by a neural network and feed them into a KNN or a random forest or a GBM. And in fact, using embeddings with every one of those things is way better than all of those things are uh, any of anything other than neural networks, right? So that's pretty interesting. And then if you use the embeddings with the neural network, you get the best result still. So this actually <coughs> is kind of fascinating, because um, training this neural network uh, took me you know, some hours on a Titan X, where else um, training uh, the GBM took, it was I think less than a second. Like it was so fast. I thought I had screwed something up, and then I kind of tried running it. It's like holy shit! It's it's giving accurate predictions. So GBMs and random forests are so fast. So you know, in in your organization, you know, you could try taking everything that you could think of as a categorical variable, and once a month, train a neural net with with embeddings, and then store those embeddings in a database table and tell. You know, all of your business users, hey, anytime you want to create a model that incorporates day of week or store ID or customer ID, you know, you can go and grab the embeddings. Uh, and so they're basically like word vectors, but they're customer vectors and store vectors. 
and product vectors. So um, I've never seen anybody write about this um, other than this paper. Um, and even in this paper, they don't really get to the, the this this hugely important idea of like what you could do with these embeddings. Well, what's the difference between A and B and C? Is it like different data types flowing in, or A and B and C on the previous, previous one? Uh, yeah, we're going to get to that in a moment. Yeah. So yeah, basically the the different things is like A might be the store ID, B might be the product ID, and C might be the day of week. One of the really ni nice things that they did in this um, paper was to then um, draw some, project some projections of some of these embeddings. And they just used uh, T-SNE, it doesn't really matter what the projection method is. But here's some, um, some uh, interesting ideas. They took um, each state of uh, Germany, this is uh, all based in Germany, and they um, did a projection of the embeddings from the state field. Right? And here is those projections. And I've drawn around them uh, different colored circles, and you might notice the different colored circles exactly correspond to the different colored circles on a map of Germany. Now, these were just random embeddings trained with SGD trying to predict sales in stores at Rossmann. And yet somehow they've drawn a map of Germany. So obviously the reason why is because you know things close to each other in Germany have similar behaviors around how they respond to events and you know who buys what kinds of products and so on and so forth. Um, so that's like crazy fascinating. Um, here's the kind of bigger picture. Every one of these dots is um, um, the distance <coughs> between two stores. Um, and this shows the correlation between the distance in embedding space versus the actual distance between the stores, right? And so you can basically see that there's this strong correlation between things being close to each other in real life and close to each other in these SGD trained embeddings. Um, here's a couple more pictures. I, uh, all the lines drawn on top of mine, but everything else is just there um, from the paper. Um, on the left is days of the week embedding. And you can see that days of the week that are near each other have ended up embedded close together. Uh, on the right is months of the year embedding. Again, same thing. Okay? Um, and you can see that you know the weekend is clearly separate. Um, so um, that's that's where we're going to get to, right? And I'm actually going to take you through the end-to-end -end process. Um, and I, I rebuilt the I rebuilt the end-to-end -end process from scratch. Um, and tried to make it in as few lines as code as possible, um, because you know we just haven't really looked at any of these structured data type problems before. So you know it's it's kind of a very different process, um, and uh, you know even a kind of a different set of of techniques. All right, so we import the usual stuff. Um, when you try to do this stuff yourself, um, you'll find a f uh, three or four libraries we haven't used before. So when you hit something that says um, uh, module not found, just uh, pip install. You can just pip install all these things. They're pure, um, pure Python. We'll talk about them as we get to them. Okay, so the data that comes from Kaggle comes down as a bunch of CSV files. Um, and uh, I wrote a quick thing to combine some of those CSVs together. And um, this was one of those competitions where um, people were allowed to use additional external data as long as they were um, shared on the forum. So the data I'll share with you, I'm going to kind of combine it all um, into one place for you. Um, so I've commented these out because the, the stuff I'll give you will have already run this concatenation process. Um, so the basic tables that you're going to um, get access to is uh, the training set itself, um, a list of stores, a list of um, which state each store is in, a list of uh, each um, the abbreviation and the name of each state in Germany, um, a list of uh, data from Google Trends. So like if you've used Google Trends, you can basically see how particular keywords change over time. I don't actually... <laughs> I don't actually know which keywords they um, used, but you know somebody 
found that there were some Google Trends keywords that correlated well, so we've got access to those. Um, some information about the weather, and then a test set. So um, I'm not sure that we've really used pandas much, if at all, um, yet, so let's talk a bit about pandas. So pandas lets us take this kind of structured data and manipulate it in similar ways to the way you would manipulate it um, in a database, right? So the first thing you do, so pandas, just like NumPy tends to become NP, pandas tends to become PD. So um, pd.readcsv is going to return a, um, a data frame. Okay, so a data frame, it's like a, a database table. Um, if you've used R, it's called the same thing. Um, so this uh, readcsv is going to return a data frame cont containing the information from this CSV file. Okay, and um, we're going to go through each one of those table names and read the CSV. So this will end up. This list comprehension is going to return a list of data frames. Um, so I can now go ahead and display um, the the head. So the first five rows from each table, and that's a good way to kind of get a sense of what these tables are. Okay. So here's the so the first one is the trading set. <clears throat> so for some store on some date, they had some level of sales to some number of customers, and they were either open or closed. They either had a promotion on or they didn't. It either was a holiday or it wasn't for state and school and then some additional information about the data. So that's the basic information we have. And then everything else we join onto that. So for example, um, for each store, we can join up some information, uh, some kind of categorical variable about what kind of store it is. Um, I have no idea what this is, it might be a different brand or something. Um, what kinds of products do they carry? Again, it's just a letter, I don't know what it means, but maybe it's like some are electronics, maybe some are supermarkets, maybe some are full spectrum. <coughs> um, how far away is the nearest competitor? Um, and what um, year and month did the competitor open for business? Um, notice that sometimes the, the competitor opened for business quite late in the game, like, like later than some of the data we're actually looking at. So that's going to be a little bit confusing. Um, and then this thing called Promo 2, which as far as I understand it is basically, um, is this a store which has some kind of uh, standard promotion timing going on? And so you can see here that these are, this store has standard promotions in January, April, July, and October. So that's the stores. Um, uh, we also know for each store what state they're in based on the abbreviation. And then we can find out for each state what is the name of that state. And then for each, this is slightly weird, this is a state abbreviation, the last two letters. In this state, during this week, this was the Google Trend data for some keyword, I'm not sure what keyword it was. Um, for this state name, on this date, is the temperature, dew point, so forth. And then finally, here's the test set. It's identical to the training set, but we have, don't have the number of customers and we don't have the number of sales. Okay, so like this is a pretty standard kind of industry data set. It's you know we've got some things, we've got a kind of a central table, various tables related to that, um, and some things representing uh, time periods or time points. Um, one of the nice things you can do in pandas um, is to use this uh, uh, pandas summary module and call data frame summary for a table dot summary and that will return a whole bunch of information about every field um, so I'm not going to go through all of it in detail but you can see for example for the number of, for the sales you know on average 5800 sales standard deviation of 3800 sometimes the sales goes all the way down to zero sometimes all the way up to 41,000 um, there's no missing to sales that's good to know. Um, so this is the kind of thing that's good to kind of scroll through and identify, you know, okay, competition open since month is missing about a third of the time, that's good to know. Um, there's 12 unique states, um, so that might be worth checking because there's actually 16 things in our state table for some reason. Um, 
Google Trend data is never missing, that's good. Um, the year goes from 2012 through to 2015. Um, the weather data is never missing. Um, and then um, here's our test set. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that might screw up a model. It's like actually sometimes the test set is missing the information about whether that store was open or not. So that's something to be careful of. Okay, so we can take that um, list of tables and just destructure it out into a whole bunch of different table names. Um, find out how big the training set is. Find out how big the test set is. Um, and then you know, with this kind of uh, um, problem, there's going to be a whole bunch of data cleaning. Um, and a bunch of feature engineering. Um, and so, um, you know, neural nets don't make any of that go away, um, um, particularly because we're using this style of neural net where, you know, we're basically feeding in a whole bunch of separate continuous and categorical variables. So, <clears throat> um, simplify things a bit, turn state holidays into booleans, um, and then I'm going to join all of these tables together, right? So. <coughs> Um, I always use a default join type of an outer join, right? So you can see here, this is how we join in um, pandas. We say table.merge table2, and then to make a left outer join, how equals left, and then you say, okay, what's the name of the fields that you're going to join on the left-hand side? What are the fields you're going to join on the right-hand side? And then if um, both tables have uh, some fields with the same name, what are you going to um, uh, suffix those fields with? So on the left-hand side, we're not going to add any suffix. On the right-hand side, we'll put in underscore y. So, you know, again, I try to refactor things as much as I can. So if we're going to join lots of things. Let's create one function to do the joining, and then we can call it lots of times. Was there any um, fields uh, referring to the same value but named differently? Um, not that I saw, no. Um, and, it, and it wouldn't matter too much if there were, because, you know, when we ran the model, no problem. And I say we have a question um, in the forum. Would you liken the use of embeddings from a neural network to extraction of implicit features, or can we think of it more like what a PCA would do, like dimensionality reduction? Um, Let's talk about it more when we get there, but I mean basically when you deal with categorical variables in any kind of model, you have to decide what to do with them, right? And um, <clears throat> um, one of my favorite um, data scientists, uh, or a pair of them actually, um, who are very nearly neighbors of Rachel and mine, um, have this fantastic uh, R package called vTreat, um, which has like a bunch of state-of-the-art um, approaches to, to dealing with stuff like categorical variable um, encoding. And so, you know, the, um, the obvious way to do categorical variable encoding is to um, just do a one-hot encoding, and that's the way nearly everybody puts it into their gradient boosting machines or random forests or whatever. Um, but one of the things that vTreat does is it um, has some much more interesting techniques. So for example, um, um, so this is uh, John and Nina's package, um, um, you know, you could look at the um, univariate mean of sales for, you know, each day of week, and you could kind of encode day of week, you know, using a continuous variable which represents the mean of sales. Um, but then you have to think about like, oh, well, would I take that mean from the training set or the test set or the validation set? How do I avoid overfitting? Um, you know, there's all kinds of complex statistical subtleties to think about that, that vTreat handles um, all this stuff automatically. Now, that is, um, you know, there, there's a lot of great techniques, um, but they're kind of complicated, and in the end they tend to make a whole bunch of assumptions about like linearity or univariate um, correlations or whatever. Um, whereas with embeddings, um, we're using SGD to learn how to deal with it. You know, just like we do when we build an NLP model, 
um, or um, or a um, collaborative filtering model. You know, we provide some initially random embeddings, and the you know the system learns um, you know how do movies vary and compare to each other, or users vary, or words vary, or whatever. So you know, this is uh, to me the ultimate pure technique. And and of course, the other nice thing about embeddings is we get to pick the dimensionality of the embedding, so we can decide. How much complexity and how much learning are we going to put into um, each of the categorical variables? And we'll, we'll see how to do that in a moment. Um, okay, <clears throat> so um, one complexity was that the um, I think it's the weather. Um, yes, the weather uses the name of the state rather than the um, abbreviation of the state. So we can just go ahead and join weather to states uh, to get the abbreviation. Um, the Google Trend information about the week, you know, week from, from A to B, we can split that apart. Um, you can see here um, one of the things that uh, happens in the Google Trend data is that one of the states is called NI, or else in the rest of the data it's called HB, NI. So this is a good opportunity to learn about pandas indexing. So pandas indexing, most of the time you want to use this .ix method, right? And the .ix method <coughs> is your kind of general indexing method. And it's going to take two things, um, a list of rows to select and a list of columns to select. And you can use it in kind of pretty standard intuitive ways. This is a lot like NumPy, right? This here is going to return a list of booleans. Uh, which things are in this state. And if you pass the list of booleans uh, to the pandas row selector, it will just return the rows where that boolean is true. So therefore, um, this is just going to return the rows from Google Trend, where Google Trend.state is NI. And then the second thing we pass in is a list of columns. In this case, we just got one column. And one very important thing to remember, again, just like NumPy, you can put this kind of thing on the left hand side of an equal sign. In computer science, we call this an L value. So you can use it as an L value. So we can take this state field, four things which are equal to NI, and change their value to this. Okay, so this is like a very nice, simple technique that you'll use all the time in pandas, um, both for looking at things and for changing things. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a few questions. Um, one is, in this particular example, do you think the granularity of the data matter, as in per day or per week, um, is one better than the other? Yeah, I mean, um, um, I would want to have the lower granularity um, so that I can capture that. I mean, the, the um, ideally, you'd want time as well. Um, it kind of depends how the organization is going to use it, right? Like, do they what are they going to do with this information? It's probably for like purchasing and stuff. So maybe they don't care about an hourly level. Um, but clearly, the the difference between Sunday sales and Wednesday sales will be quite significant. So, you, yeah, this is mainly a a kind of business context or domain understanding question. Um, another question is: Do you know if there's any work that compares for structured data, supervised embeddings like these, to embeddings that come from an unsupervised paradigm, such as an autoencoder? It seems like you'd get more useful for for prediction embeddings with the former case, but if you wanted general purpose embeddings, you might prefer the latter. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you guys are aware of my feelings about autoencoders. <laughs> you know, it's like giving up on life. Um, um, you know, you can always come up with a loss function that's more interesting than an autoencoder loss function. Basically, um, I would be very surprised if embeddings that came from a sales model. Um, were not more useful for just about everything than a, something that came from an unsupervised model. Um, but these, these, these things are easily tested, and if you do find a model that they don't work as well with, then you can come up with a different set of supervised embeddings for that model. Um, and then there's also just a note that dot .ix is deprecated, and we should use dot .loc instead. Okay. Um, I was going to mention pandas is changing a lot. <clears throat> and um, because I've been running this course, I have not been keeping track of the recent versions of pandas. So thank you. So that should be... Um, Google trend.log. 
there's um, in pandas there's a whole page called advanced indexing methods um, I don't find the pandas documentation terribly clear to be honest But there is a fantastic book by the author of pandas called Python for data analysis um, There is a new edition out um, and uh, it uh, covers um, um, Pandas numpy matplotlib whatever um, Yeah, um, that's the best way by far to actually understand um, Pandas because the documentation is a bit of a nightmare and it keeps changing so the new version has all the um, new stuff in it um, Yeah, with these kind of indexing methods Pandas tries really hard to be intuitive Which means that like quite often you'll read the documentation for these methods and it'll say like you know if it ta if, if you pass it a boolean It'll behave in this way if you pass it a float it'll behave this way if it's an index It's this way unless this other thing happens and like I don't find it intuitive at all because in the end I need to know how something works in order to use it correctly And so you end up having to remember this huge list of things, right? So this is I think pandas is great But this is one thing to be very careful of is to really um, Make sure you understand how all these indexing methods actually work and I, I know Rachel's laughing because she's been there and you know Probably laughing in disgust at what we all have to go through <laughs> Another question, when you use embeddings from a supervised model in another model, do you have to worry about data leakage? Um, yes, you always have to worry about data leakage. Um, I think that's a great point. You know, uh, I, I don't think I've got anything to add to that. You can figure out easily enough if there's data leakage. Um, <coughs> so yeah. Um, that's a, a great, great question, and you need to, yeah, definitely something to think about. Okay, um, so there's this kind of standard um, set of steps that I take uh, for every single mach structured machine learning model I do, um, and one of those is every time I see a date, I always do this. Right? I always create four more fields: the year. The month of year, the week of year, um, and the day of week. Um, this is, um, you know, something which should be like automatically built into every data loader. I feel um, it's so important because you know these are the kinds of structures that you see, and once every single date has got this added to it, um, you're doing great. So you can see that I uh, add that into. Um, all of my um, tables that have a date field. Um, so we'll have that from now on. Um, so now I go ahead and do all of these outer joins. And you'll see that the first thing I do after every outer join is check whether the thing I just joined with has any nulls. Right? So like even if you're sure that these things match perfectly. I would still never ever do an inner join Right do the outer join and then check for nulls and that way if anything changes ever or if you ever make a mistake One of these things will not be zero Right um, if this was happening in a production process, you know, this would be a this would be an assert This would be you know emailing Henry at 2 a.m. to say like You know something you're relying on is not working the way it was meant to look out um, so that's why I always do it this way. Um, so you can see I'm just basically joining my um, training um, to uh, everything else um, until it's all in there together in one big thing. Um, okay, so that table, everything joined together, is called joined. And then um, I do a whole bunch more thinking about. Um, well, I didn't do the thinking. The, the people that won this competition, um, and then I replicated their results from scratch. Um, you know, think about um, what are all the other things you might want to do with these dates. So, uh, competition open. Um, we met. We noticed before a third of the time they're empty. Uh, so we just fill in the empties with some kind of sentinel value, um, because a lot of the, um, machine learning systems don't like missing values. Um, <coughs> Fill in the missing months with some sentinel value um, Again keep on filling in missing data. So fill in a is a really important thing to be aware of um, Retro 
is the filling a, the month with one isn't one an, a real value and isn't that a problem? I guess the answer is yes, it is a problem. Um, but um, in this case, I happen to know that um, every time year is empty, month is also empty, and we only ever use both of them together. So any model, whether it be tree based or neural net based or whatever, is going to take advantage of that um, um, of that fact. So yeah, um, probably would have been safer to pick something else. <clears throat> okay, so um, we don't really care. Actually, when the competition store was um, opened, what we really care about is how long is it between when they were opened and the particular row that we're looking at. You know, the sales on the second of February 2014. How long was it between second of February 2014 and when the competition opened? So you can see here we use this um, very important dot apply function, um, which just uh, runs a, um, a Python function on every row of a data frame. Um, and in this case, the function is to create a new date um, from the open since year and the open since month, and we're just going to assume that it's the middle of the month. Um, and that's our um, competition open since. And then we can get our days open by just doing a um, subtract. Um, in um, pandas, every date field has this um, special magical DT property, which is what all the then, um, you know, Days, month, year, all that stuff is sits inside this little DT property. Um, now, sometimes, as I mentioned, um, the competition actually opened later than um, the particular observation we're looking at, so that would give us a negative. So, if we replace our negatives with zero, um, and we're going to um, use an embedding for this. Um, so that's why we replace days open with months open, um, so we have less um, values. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't actually try replacing this with a continuous variable. Um, I suspect it wouldn't make too much difference, um, but you know, this is what they did. Um, in order to make the embedding again not too big, um, they replaced anything that was bigger than two years with two years. Okay, so there's our unique values. Um, every time you do something, print something out to make sure that the thing you thought you did is what you actually did. Um, it's much easier if we're using Excel because, like, you see straight away what you're doing. But in Python, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you have to really be rigorous about checking your work at every step. Um, you know, it, um, when I build stuff like this, I generally make, you know, at least one error in every cell, um, so um, check carefully. Okay, do the same thing for the promo days. Um, turn those into weeks. Um, yeah, okay, so that's some basic pre-processing. You get the idea of how Pandas works, hopefully. Um, so the next thing that they did in the paper um, was some um, uh, again, some a very common kind of time series feature manipulation, um, uh, one to be aware of, which is they basically wanted to say, okay, um, every time there's a promotion or every time there's a holiday, I want to create some additional fields um, for every you know for every one of our training set rows, which is on a particular date. It's just like on that date, how long is it until the next holiday? How long is it until the previous holiday? How long is it until the next promotion? How long is it since the previous promotion? So if we basically create um, those fields, um, you know, this is this is the kind of thing which it's super difficult for any GBM or random forest or neural net to figure out how to calculate itself, right? It's it's not a um, you know, there's no obvious kind of mathematical function that it's going to build on its own. So we, this is the kind of feature engineering that we have to do uh, in order to allow us to use these kinds of techniques effectively on time series data. So a lot of people who work with time series data, um, uh, you know, particularly in academia, outside of industry, they're just not aware of the fact that, that you know, the state-of-the-art approaches really involve all these heuristics. Right, you know, separating out your dates into their components, 
turning everything you can into um, durations, um, both forwards and backwards, uh, and also doing a bunch of, you'll see in a moment, um, running averages. So, um, you know, when I used to do a lot of this kind of work, um, I had, you know, a bunch of library functions that I would run on every file that came in and would automatically do these things for every combination of dates, you know. Um, so this um, thing of like how long until the next promotion, how long since the t previous promotion, is um, not easy to do in any database system pretty much, uh, or indeed in pandas, because generally speaking these kind of systems uh, are looking for relationships between tables, but we're trying to look at relationships between rows. Right? So I had to create this um, tiny little simple little class to do this. So basically what happens is, let's say I'm looking at school holiday. Right? So I sort my data frame by store and then by date, and I call this little function called add elapsed school holiday after. Now what does add elapsed do? Add elapsed is going to create an instance of this um, class called elapsed, and in this case it's going to be called with school holiday. So what this class is going to do, we're going to be calling this apply function again, so remember it's going to run on every single row, and it's going to call my elapsed class dot get for every row. So I'm going to go through every row in order of store, in order of date, and I'm trying to find how long has it been since the last school holiday. So when I create this object, I just have to keep track of, okay, what field is it? Okay, school holiday. Initialize, when was the last time we saw a school holiday? Okay, and the answer is we haven't, so it's, you know, initialize it to not a number. Um, and we also have to know, like, each time we, like, cross over to a new store. Like, when we cross over to a new store, we basically have to reinitialize. So the previous store was zero. So every time we call get, we basically check, okay, have we crossed over to a new store? And if so, just initialize both of those things back again. And then we just say, okay, um, is this a school holiday? If so, then the last time you saw a school holiday is today. And then finally return, how long is it between today and the last time you saw a school holiday? Right? So it's basically, this class is a way of keeping track of kind of um, some memory about like when did I last see this um, observation. So then by just calling df.apply, it's going to keep track of this for every single row, and so then I can call that for school holiday, after and before, the only difference being that I, for before, I just sort my dates in descending order. State holiday and promo. Okay, so that's going to add, in the end, six fields, how long until and how long since the last school holiday, state holiday, and promotion. And then there's a question, or two questions. Um, one asking, is this similar to a windowing function? Um, not quite. We're about to do a windowing function. Okay. And then is there a reason to think that the current approach would be problematic with sparse data? Um, I don't see why, but I'm not sure I quite follow. Um, we've got one next door. Um, so we don't care about absolute dates, right? We, we care about time deltas between events. <coughs> we care about two things. We, care, we do care about the dates, but we've already like pulled out the... We, don't, we care about the like what year is it, what day of week it is, yeah. Um, and we also care about the elapsed time between the uh, uh, the date I'm predicting sales for and the previous and next of various events. Okay, and then windowing functions, uh, did you have another reaction? Yes, um, for the features that are time until an event, how do you deal with that given that not you might not know when the last event is in the data? Well, um, all I do is I've so sorted descending, right, and then we initialize <coughs> last with not a number. So basically, um, when we then go subtract, uh, here we are, subtract, and it tries to subtract not a number, um, we'll end up with a null, right? So basically anything that's uh, an unknown time, because it's at one end or the other, is going to end up null, which is why... Um, we uh, 
well, maybe it's later on, but shortly, um, we're going to replace those nulls with, um, with zeros. Okay, um, Pandas has this slightly strange way of thinking about indexes, but um, once you get used to it, it's fine. At any point, you can call dataframe.setIndex and pass in <coughs> um, a field. Um, you then have to just kind of remember what field you have as the index, because quite a few methods in Pandas use the kind of currently active index by default, and of course things will run faster when you do stuff with a currently active index. Um, and you can pass multiple fields, in which case you end up with a multiple key index. Okay, so the next thing we do is these um, windowing functions. So a windowing function uh, in Pandas, uh, we can use this rolling. So this is like a rolling mean, rolling min, rolling max, whatever you like. So this basically uh, says, all right, um, let's take um, our data frame um, with the columns we're interested in, school holiday, state holiday, and promo, and we're going to keep track of like how many holidays are there in the next week and the previous week. How many promos are there in the next week and the previous week? So um, <clears throat> to do that, we can um, sort here we are by date. Group by, store, and then rolling will be applied to each group. So within each group, create a rolling seven-day sum. Okay, so it's kind of like, you know, um, it, it's the kind of uh, notation I'm never likely to remember. You know, but you can just look it up. Um, and so this is how you do like group by type stuff. Um, Pandas is actually has uh, quite a lot of uh, time series functions, um, and this rolling function is one of the most useful ones. Uh, you know, Wes McKinney uh, had a background as a quant, if memory serves correctly, and um, so you know, quants love their time series functions. So I think that was a lot of the history of, of pandas. So if you're interested in time series stuff, you'll find a lot of uh, time series stuff in pandas. Okay. <coughs> Um, one helpful parameter um, that sits inside a lot of methods is in place equals true. Um, that means that rather than returning a new data frame with this change made, it changes the data frame you already have. <coughs> and uh, when your data frames are quite big, this is going to save a lot of time and memory. That's a good little trick to know about. Okay, so now we merge all these together. And we can now see that we've got all these after school holiday, before school holiday and our backward and forward running means. Um, and then <coughs> we join that up to our original data frame, and here we have our final result. So there it is. Um, you know, we ended up, we started out with a pretty small set of fields in the training set, um, but we've done this, uh, this feature engineering, and um, this feature engineering is not arbitrary. Like, although I didn't create this solution, I was just re-implementing the solution that was um, came, came from the com competition third place getters. Um, <coughs> this is nearly exactly the set of um, feature engineering steps I would have done. Like, it's just a really standard way of thinking about a time series. Okay, so you know you can definitely borrow these ideas um, pretty closely. Okay, so now that we've got that, um, you know, we've got this this table. We've done our feature engineering. Um, we now want to feed it into a neural network. So um, to feed it into a neural network, we have to do a few things. Um, the categorical variables have to be turned into um, um, one hot encoded variables or at least into um, contiguous integers. <coughs> and the continuous variables we probably want to normalize to a zero mean one standard deviation. There's a um, very little known um, package called sklearn pandas, um, and actually I contributed some new stuff to it for this course to make this even easier to use. Um, if you use this data frame mapper from sklearn pandas, as you'll see, it makes life very easy. Without it, life is very hard. And because very few people know about it, the vast majority of code you will find on the internet 
makes life look very hard. Okay, so use this code, not the other code. Um, actually, I was talking to some of the students the other day, and they were saying, like, for their project, they were like stealing lots of code from part one of the course because they just couldn't find, you know, anywhere else people writing any of any of the kinds of code that we've used. Like, you know, the stuff that we've learned throughout this course is, in on the whole, not not code that lives elsewhere very much at all. So, like, feel you know, feel free to use a lot of these functions in your own work. Um, you know, because I've really tried to make them the best version of that function. So one way to do the um, embeddings um, and the way that they did it in the paper is to basically say um, for each categorical variable, they just manually decided what embedding dimensionality to use. They don't say in the paper how they pick these dimensionalities, um, but generally speaking, things with a larger number of separate levels tend to have more dimensions. So like there's I think there's like a thousand stores, so that has a big embedding dimensionality. Um, where else, obviously, things like promo, forward and backward, or day of week, or whatever, you know, have much smaller ones. Um, so this is this dictionary I created that basically goes from the name of the field to the embedding dimensionality. Again, this is all code that you guys can use in your models. Um, so then all I do is I say, okay, my categorical variables is, okay, go through my dictionary, sort it in reverse order of the value, um, and then get the first thing from that. So that's just going to give me the um, keys from this in a reverse order of dimensionality. Um, <coughs> continuous variables is just a list. Okay. Um, uh, just make sure that there's no nulls. So continuous variables replace nulls with zeros. Categorical variables replace nulls with empties. And then here's where we use the data frame mapper. A data frame mapper takes um, a list of tuples, um, a list of tuples with just two items in. The first item is the name of the variable. So in this case, I'm looping through each categorical variable name. And the second thing in the tuple is a class. Uh, or actually an instance of a class, um, which is going to do your pre-processing. And there's really just two that you're going to use almost all the time. For categorical variables, um, sklearn comes with something called Label Encoder. Um, it's, it's really badly documented, in fact really misleadingly documented, um, but this is, the most, this is exactly what you want. It's something that takes um, a column, figures out what are all the unique values that appear in that column, and replaces them with a set of contiguous integers. Right? So if you've got the days of the week, Monday through Sunday, it'll replace them with zero through, zeros through sevens. And then very importantly, you know, this is critically important, you need to make sure that the training set and the test set have the same codes. Right? There's no point in having Sunday be zero in the training set and one in the test set. So because we're actually instantiating this, this class here, this object is going to actually keep track of which codes it's using. Um, and then ditto for the continuous, we want to normalize them to a 0, 1 um, variables. But again, we need to remember what was the mean that we subtracted, what was the standard deviation we divided by, so that we can do exactly the same thing to the test set. Otherwise, again, our models are going to be nearly totally useless. So the way the data frame mapper works is that it, it's using this instantiated object, which is going to keep track with this information. So this is basically code you can copy and paste in every one of your models, right? Once we've got those mappings, you just pass those to a data frame mapper, and then you call dot .fit, um, passing in your data set. Um, and so this thing now is a special object which has a dot .features um, property that's going to contain uh, all of the features, all of the pre-processed features that you want. So categorical columns contains the result of doing this mapping, basically doing this label encoding. Um, so yeah, so it, you know, <coughs> in some ways the details of how this works doesn't matter too much because you could just use exactly this code in every one of your models. Same for continuous, it's exactly the same code, um, but of course continuous, it's going to be using um, standard scalar, which is the scikit learn thing that turns it into a zero mean one standard deviation um, variable. 
So we've now got continuous columns have all been standardized. So here's an example of uh, uh, the first five um, uh, rows from the zeroth column um, for a categorical, and then ditto for a continuous. Okay, so you can see these have been turned into um, um, integers, and these have been turned into numbers which are going to average to zero and have a standard deviation of one. Um, one of the nice things about um, this uh, data frame mapper is that you can now take that object and actually store it, pickle it, and so now you can use those um, um, categorical encodings and uh, scaling um, parameters um, elsewhere. By just unpickling it, you've immediately got those same, um, same parameters. Um, for my categorical um, um, variables, you can see here the number of unique classes in every one. Okay, so here's my 1,100 stores and 31 uh, days of the month and seven days of the week and so forth. All right, so um, that's the kind of key pre-processing that has to be done. Um, so here is their big mistake, and I think if they didn't do this big mistake, they probably would have won. Their big mistake is that they went join join dot sales not equal to zero. So they've removed all of the rows with no sales. Uh, those are all of the rows where the store was closed. Why was this a big mistake? Because if you go to the Rossman store sales competition website and click on kernels and look at the kernel that got the highest rating. Um, oh, this is not the right one. Sorry, this kernels. <laughs> Exploratory data analysis Rossman. Uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures. Um, here is an example of a store, store 708, and these are all from this uh, kernel. Um, here is a period of time where it was closed to refurbishment. <coughs> this happens a lot in Rossman stores. You get these periods of time when you get zeros for sales, lots in a row. Look what happens immediately before and after. Right? So in the data set that we're looking at, our unfortunate third place winners deleted all of these. Right? So they had no ability to build a feature that could find this. So this store 708. Look, here's another one where it was closed. Same thing. So um, this turns out to be super common, um, and the second place winner um, actually built a feature, <coughs> and you know it's going to be exactly the same feature we've seen before. How many days since the closing, and how many days until the next closing? And if, if they had just done that, I'm pretty sure they would have won. Um, so that was their big mistake. Um, this um, this kernel has. <coughs> A number of interesting analyses in it. Here's another one which um, I think our neural net can capture, um, although it might have been better to be explicit. Um, some stores um, opened on Sundays. Now, most didn't, um, but some did. And for those stores that opened on Sundays, um, their sales on Sundays were far higher than on any other day. Right? And I guess that's because in Germany, I guess not many shops open on Sundays. So um, something else that they didn't explicitly do was create a like is store open on Sunday field. Having said that, I think the neural net may have been able to put that in the embedding. So like if you're interested during the week, you could try adding this field and see if it actually improves it or not. Certainly be interested to hear if you try adding this field. Um, like do you find that you actually would win the competition? Um, because this um, this Sunday thing, um, this is uh, these are all from the same Kaggle kernel. Here's the day of week, um, and here's the sales as a box plot. Um, and you can see, you know, normally on a Sunday, um, it's not that the sales are much higher. Um, so it's really explicitly just for these particular stores. Okay, so that's the kind of um, uh, visualization stuff which is really helpful to to do as you work through these kinds of problems, is to like 
I don't know, just draw lots of pictures. And those pictures were drawn in R, and you know, R is actually pretty good for this kind of structured data. Um, so I have a question. So for categorical fields, they are converted by the numbers, not with mean zero. Right. They were like just integers, you know, Monday zero, Tuesday one, whatever. Yeah. And as is, they will send to neural network, just like. Uh... We're going to get there. Okay. Yeah. There, we're going to use embeddings. <coughs> just like we did with word embeddings. Remember, we turned every word into a into a word index. You know, so our sentences, rather than being like, you know, um, the dog ate. The beans, it would be, you know, 3, 6, 12, 2, whatever. We're going to do the same basic thing. We've done the same basic thing. Okay, so now that we've done our uh, terrible mistake, um, we've now got, still got 844,000 rows left. As per usual, I made it really easy for me to um, create a random sample and did most of my analysis with a random sample, um, but can just as easily not do the random sample. Um, so now I've got a separate um, sample version of it. Um, okay, split it into training and test. Now, <clears throat> notice here, the way I split it into training and test is not randomly. And the reason it's not randomly is because in the Kaggle competition, they set it up the smart way. The smart way to set up um, a, a test set in a time series is to make your test set the most recent period of time. Right? If you um, choose random points, you've got two problems. The first is you're predicting tomorrow's sales where you always have the previous day's sales, which you know is very rarely the way things really work. Um, and then secondly, you're ignoring the fact that in the real world, you're always trying to model you know, a few days or a few weeks or a few months in the future that haven't happened yet. So the way you want to set up, if you were building um, uh, if you were setting up the data for such a model yourself, you would need to be deciding, okay, how often am I going to be rerunning this model? How long is it going to take for those model results to get into the field to be used and however they're being used? Um, and in this case, I guess they just, I can't remember, I think it's like a month or two. <coughs> All right, so in that case, I should make sure there's a month or two gap between, you know, or a month or two um, test set. Um, which is the last bit, right? So you can see here, um, I've taken the last 10% as my um, validation set, and it's literally just, here's the first bit, and here's the last bit, and since it was um, already sorted um, uh, by date, uh, this ensures that I have it done the way I want. I just wanted to point out that it's 10 till 8, so Thank we should you. probably take a break soon. We sure will. Um, Okay, so um, this is how you take that um, data frame mapper object we created earlier. Remember, we called dot fit in order to like learn, you know, <coughs> the transformation parameters. You then call transform to actually do it, right? So take my training set and transform it to grab the categorical variables, and then. The continuous preprocessing is the same thing for my continuous map, so preprocess my training set to, and grab my continuous variables. Okay, so um, that's nearly done. Um, the only uh, final piece is in their solution, they modified their um, their target, uh, so their their sales value. And the way they modified it was that they found what is the highest um, amount of sales, right? Um, and they took the log of that, and then they modified all of their y values to take the log of sales divided by the maximum log of sales. So what this means is that <coughs> the y values are going to vary, um, um, they're going to be no higher than 1. Um, and furthermore, remember how they had a long tail, the average was 5,000, but the maximum was like 40-something thousand? Um, this is really common, right? Like most financial data, sales data, so forth, generally has a nicer shape when it's logged than it does not. Um, so taking a log is a really good idea. The reason that, um, they, as well as taking the log, they also did this division, is it means that what we can now do is we can use an activation function in our neural net of a sigmoid, 
right, which goes between 0 and 1, um, and then just multiply by the maximum log. Um, and so that's basically going to ensure that the data is in the right um, scaling area. Um, I actually tried taking this out, and it actually um, this technique doesn't really seem to help. Um, and it actually reminds me of the style transfer paper um, where um, they mentioned they originally had like a hyperbolic tan layer at the end for exactly the same reason to make sure everything was like between 0 and 255 and actually it turns out if you just use a linear activation it worked just as well. So um, interestingly this idea of um, using sigmoids at the end in order to get the right range doesn't seem to be that helpful. Um, my guess is the reason why is because for a sigmoid it's like really difficult to get the maximum. And I think actually what they should have done is they probably should have like instead of using maximum they should have used like maximum times 1.25 you know so that they never have to predict one you know because it's impossible to predict one um, because it's a sigmoid. Um, someone asked is there any issue in fitting the preprocessors on the full training and validation data shouldn't they be fit only to the training set? Um, no it's fine um, in fact um, for the Categorical variables, you know, if you don't include the test set, then you're going to have some codes that aren't there at all. Um, whereas this way, there's going to be random, um, which is better than failing. Um, uh, yeah, as for deciding, you know, what to divide and subtract in order to get a zero one random variable, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not. It's, there's no leakage involved. That's what you're worried about. Um, okay. Um, Root mean squared percent error is what the Kaggle competition used <laughs> as the uh, official loss function, so this is just calculating that. Um, so before we take our break, um, we'll just uh, finally take a look at the um, definition of the model. Um, I'll kind of work backwards. <coughs> okay, here's the basic model. Right? Um, get our embeddings, combine the embeddings with the continuous variables, a tiny bit of dropout, one dense layer, two dense layers, more dropout, and then the final sigmoid activation function. Um, you'll see that I've got like commented out stuff all over the place, and this is because like I had a lot of questions. We're going to cover this after the break. A lot of questions about some of the details <coughs> of like why did they do things certain ways? You know, some of the things they did were like so weird. I just thought they couldn't possibly be right. So I, I did some experimenting. We'll learn more about that in a moment. Um, so the embeddings, as per usual, I create a little function um, to create an embedding, which first of all creates my um, regular Keras input layer, and then it creates my embedding layer, and then how many embedding dimensions am I going to use? Sometimes I look them up in that dictionary I had earlier, uh, and sometimes I calculated them using this simple approach of saying uh, I will use however many levels there are in the categorical variable divided by two um, with a maximum of 50. Um, so it, like these were two different techniques I was playing with. Um, normally with um, like word embeddings you have a whole sentence, right? And so you end up, you're going to feed it to an R and N, and so you have time steps. Right? So normally you have an input length equal to the, your length of your sentence. Right, this is the time steps for an RNN. We don't have an RNN. We don't have any time steps. We just have one element in one column. So therefore I have to pass flatten after this because it's going to have this redundant unit one time axis that I don't want. Right? So this is just because you know people don't normally do this kind of stuff with embeddings, so they're assuming that you're going to kind of want it in a format ready to go to an RNN. So this is just turning it back into a normal format. <coughs> so we grab each embedding, um, we end up with a whole list of those, um, we then uh, combine all of those embeddings with all of our continuous variables into a single list of variables, um, and so then our model um, is going to have um, all of those embedding inputs and all of our continuous inputs, and then we can compile it and train it. All right. So let's take a break and uh, see you back here at um, five past eight.
Okay, so um, so we've got our neural net um, set up. Um, we train it in the usual way. Um, go dot fit um, and um, yeah, away we go. So um, that's basically that, um, and yeah, it's um, it trains reasonably quickly. Um, six minutes in this case. Um, sorry, Rachel. Yep. Uh, so we got two questions that came in. I think right when we broke. Yeah, no problem. Uh, one of them is for the normalization. Is it possible to use another function other than log, such as sigmoid? Um, I don't think you'd want to use sigmoid. Like a, a kind of financial data and sales data and stuff tends to be of a shape where log will make it more linear, mm -hmm. um, which is generally what you want. And then when we log um, log transform our target variable, we're also transforming the squared error. Is this a problem, or is it helping the model to find a better minimum error in the untransformed space? Yeah, so you've got to be careful about what loss function you want. In this case, the Kaggle competition is trying to minimize root and mean squared percent error. Um, so I actually then said, okay, I want you to do mean absolute error, um, because that's, you know, when in, in log space, that's kind of basically doing the same thing, right? Because a percent is a, a ratio. Um, so this is the absolute error between two logs, which is basically the same as a ratio. So yeah, you need to make sure your loss function is appropriate um, in that space. <coughs> um, and I think this is one of the things that they didn't do in the original competition, and I tried, as you can see, I tried changing it, and I think it helped. Um, okay. Um, by the way, um, XGBoost is fantastic. Um, here is the same um, series of steps to run this model with XGBoost. As you can see, I just uh, concatenate my categorical and continuous for training and for my validation <laughs> set. Um, here is a set of uh, parameters which um, tends to work pretty well. Um, um, XGBoost has a uh, a data type called D matrix, a data matrix, which is basically a normal matrix, but it keeps track of the names of the features, so it like prints out more, you know, better, um, better information. Uh, and then you go dot train, uh, and this takes like less than a second to run, um, and it's not massively worse than um, our previous result. <coughs> and so this is like a good way to kind of get started. Um, the reason that um, XGBoost and Random Forest is particularly helpful is because it does something called variable importance, right? So this is how you get the variable importance for an XGBoost model. So it takes a second, and suddenly here is the information you need. So when I was having trouble um, um, replicating the uh, original results from the third place winners, one of the things that helped me a lot was to look at this feature importance plot and say, okay, competition distance, holy cow, that's really, really important. Um, let's make sure that my competition distance results, you know, um, pre-processing really is exactly the same. Um, and on the other hand, <coughs> um, events doesn't really matter at all, so I'm not going to worry really at all about checking my events. Um, this. Um, feature importance or variable importance plot, uh, also as it's known, um, you can also create with a random forest. Um, these, these are amazing, right? Because you're using a tree ensemble, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter the shape of anything, it doesn't matter if you have or don't have interactions, you know, this is all like totally kind of um, assumption-free. Um, so like this is, in real life, this is the first thing I do. Like the first thing I do is try to get a feature importance plot printed, because that tells me, you know, often it turns out there's only three or four variables that matter, right? And like if, if you've got ten thousand variables, so I worked uh, on a big credit scoring problem a couple of years ago. I had nine and a half thousand variables. It turned out that only nine of them mattered, right? And so the company I was working for, like literally, it spent something like five million dollars on this big management consulting project. 
and this big management consulting project had told them all these ways in which they can like capture all this information in this really clean way for their credit scoring models, and of course none of those things were in these nine that mattered. You know, so they could have saved five billion dollars, um, but they didn't because management consulting companies don't use random forests. Um, so you know, I can't overestimate, you know, uh, overstate the importance of this plot. Um, but it, you know, it's this is a deep learning course, so we're not really going to spend time talking about it. Um, now, um, I mentioned that I had um, a whole bunch of like, there's a whole bunch of like really, really, really weird things in the way that the competition third place getters did things. Um, <coughs> um, for one, they didn't normalize their continuous variables. Like, who does that? But then, when people do well in a competition, something's working, you know. Um, the um, the ways in which they initialized uh, their embeddings uh, were really really weird. Uh, but there's all these things that are really really weird. So what I did was I wrote a um, a little script um, Rosman experiments and what I did uh, was basically I copied and pasted all the important code out of my notebook and remember I've already pickled the parameters for the you know um, label encoder and the scalar so I didn't have to worry about doing those again um, and um, once I copied and pasted all that code in, so this is exactly all the code you just saw, I then had this um, um, you know, bunch of for loops, right? Pretty inelegant, right? but these are all of the things that I wanted to basically find out. Like, does it matter whether or not you use um, um, you know, one zero scaling? Um, does it matter whether you use their weird approach to initializing embeddings? Does it matter whether you use their particular dictionary of um, embedding dimensions or use my simple little formula? Um, something else I tried is, you know, they um, basically took all their continuous variables and put them through like a separate little dense layer each. And I was like, why don't we put them all together? Um, I also tried some other things like using batch normalization. So I ran this and got back every possible combination of these, right? So this is like, this is where you want to be using the script, you know? And, and, and like, I can, I can, I'm not going to tell you that I jumped straight to this. First of all, I spent days screwing around with experiments in a notebook by hand, continually forgetting what I had just done, um, until eventually I just, you know, it took me like <coughs> an hour to write this. And then, of course, I pasted it into Excel. And here it is, right? Chucked it into a pivot table, uh, used conditional formatting, and here's my results, right? So you can see all my different combinations, with and without um, normalization, um, with my special function versus their dictionary, um, using a single dense matrix versus putting everything together, using their weird init versus not using a weird init. Sorry, my my init versus um, their um, lack of init. Um, and here is this dark blue here. Is there um, what they did, right? And like to, it's it's full of weird to me, right? Um, but as you can see, it's actually the darkest blue. It's actually it actually is the best. But then when you kind of zoom out, you realize there's a whole corner over here that's like got a couple of eight sixes. It's nearly as good, right? Um, but seems much more consistent, which is and and also more consistent with sanity. Like, yes, do normalize your data, and yes, do use an appropriate initialization function. And if you do those two things, and it doesn't really matter what else you do, it's all going to work fine. So what I then did was I created a, a little um, spark line um, in Excel um, for the actual training graphs, right? And so here's their, here's their winning one, um, again, 0.085. Um, but here's the variance. Um, of like getting there. And as you can see, their approach was kind of pretty bumpy, up and down, up and down, up and down. The second best, on the other hand, right, 0.0086 rather than 0.085, is going down very smoothly. 
right? And so that made me think, given that it's in like this very stable part of the world, and given it's training much better, I actually think this is just random chance. You know, it just happened to be low in this point. I actually thought this is a better approach. You know, it's more it's more sensible and it's more consistent. <coughs> so um, this kind of approach to running experiments, I, I thought I'd just show you. Um, uh, you know, to say like when you run experiments, um, try and do it in a rigorous way and track both the kind of stability of the approach. Um, as well as the actual result of the approach. So you know this one here makes so much sense. It's like use my simple function rather than their weird dictionary, use normalization, um, use a single dense matrix, and use a thoughtful initialization. And you do all of those things, you end up with something that's basically as good um, and much more stable. Okay. Um, That's all I wanted to say about Rossman. I'm going to very briefly mention um, another competition, which is the Kaggle Taxi Destination Competition. Um, the Kaggle Destination. Oh, yeah. yeah. A question over here. Throw. Um, you you were saying that um, you did a couple of experiments. One, um, you figure out the embeddings and then put the embeddings into random forest and then put embeddings again into neural network. Oh, I didn't do that. The, um, the, that was from the paper. Um, yeah, so I, I don't yeah. understand because you just use one neural network to do everything together, no? Yeah, so uh, what they did was um, for this one here, this 115, they, they trained the neural network I just showed you. They then threw away the neural network and trained a GBM model, but for the categorical variables, rather than using one-hot encodings, they used the embeddings. That's all. Okay, so the taxi um, competition um, um, was won by the team with the, this Unicode name, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's actually turned out to be a team uh, run by uh, Yoshua Bengio, who's um, you know one of the people that um, stuck it out through the AI winter and is now kind of one of the, the leading lights um, in deep learning. And um, interestingly, the thing I just showed you, the Rossman competition, um, they actually this paper they wrote in the Rossman competition, they claimed to have invented this idea of categorical embeddings. Um, but actually, Yoshua Vendio's team won this competition a year earlier with his same technique. But, you know, again, it's so uncool, nobody noticed, even though it was Yoshua Vendio. So I want to quickly show you what they did. Um, this is the paper they wrote, right? And <clears throat> their approach to picking an embedding size was very simple. Use 10. Okay, so um, the data was um, which customer is taking this taxi? Which taxi are they in? Which taxi stand did they get the taxi from? And then quarter hour of the day, day of the week, week of the year. <clears throat> and they didn't add all kinds of other stuff. This is basically it, right? And so then they said, okay, we're going to learn embeddings inspired by NLP. Right? And so actually, to my knowledge, this is the first time this appears in the literature. Having said that, I'm sure um, a thousand people have done it before, it's just not obvious to actually make it into a paper. Um, as a quick sanity check, if you have day of the week, like with seven, even one, seven one hot variable potentials, um, mm. and embedding size of 10, mm. that, that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> yeah, so I used to think that. Um, but actually it does. Like, <coughs> I've since, I've in the last few months, quite often ended up with bigger embeddings than my original patternality. And often it does give better results. And I think it's just like, when you realize that it's just a dense layer on top of a one-pot encoding, it's like, okay, why shouldn't the dense layer have more information, you know? Um, yeah, I found it weird too. I still find it a little weird, but it, it, it definitely seems to be something that's quite useful. Um, it looks like we lost our top. Thank you. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't help. No, it does. It helps. It, does help. it helps. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've absolutely found pl plenty of times now where 
I need a bigger embedding matrix dimensionality than my than my cardinality of my categorical variable. <coughs> okay. Um, now in this competition, um, again, it's a time series competition, really, because um, the the main thing you're given, other than all this metadata, um, is a series of GPS points, which is every GPS point along a route. And at some point for the test set, the route is cut off, and you have to just figure out what the final GPS point would have been. Where are they going? <coughs> um, here's the model that they won with. <coughs> um, it turns out, again, to be very simple. <coughs> you take all the metadata we just saw and chuck it through the embeddings. You then take the first five GPS points and the last five GPS points and concatenate them together with the embeddings Chuck them through a hidden layer, then through a softmax, and now this is quite interesting. Um, what they then do is they take the result of this softmax, right, <coughs> and they combine it with clusters. Now, what are these clusters? They used mean shift clustering, and they used mean shift clustering to figure out where are the places people tend to go. Right? So with taxis, people tend to go to the airport, or they tend to go to the hospital. Or they tend to go to the shopping strip, right? <coughs> so using mean shift clustering, they came up with I think it was about 3,000 um, clusters, you know, x y coordinates of places that people tended to go. However, people don't always go to those 3,000 places. So this is the really cool thing by using a softmax, and then they took the softmax and they multiplied it. See here, multiplied it and took a weighted average using the softmax as the weights and the cluster centers as the thing that you're taking the weighted average of. So in other words, if they're going to the airport, for sure, the softmax will end up giving a p of very close to 1 for the airport cluster. On the other hand, if it's not really that clear whether they're going to this shopping strip or this movie, then those two cluster centers could both have a softmax of about 0.5, and so it's going to end up predicting somewhere halfway between the two. So like, this is really interesting. Like, they've built a different kind of architecture to anything we've seen before, where the softmax is not the last thing we do. Right? It's being used to average a bunch of clusters. Um, and so this is really smart, because the softmax forces it to be easier for it to pick a specific destination that's very common, but also makes it possible for it to predict any destination anywhere by combining you know, the average of a number of clusters together. Right? And I think this is really elegant architecture engineering. Um, so trajectory prefix, so last four dots, it's like... Last so five GPS final, points. But that's, isn't that what we're trying to predict? Uh, last five GPS points that we're given. Right? And so to create the training set, what they did was they took um, all of the routes and they truncated them randomly, basically. So every time they sampled uh, another route, <coughs> think of the data generator, basically the data generator would like randomly slice it off somewhere. Um, so this was the last five points which we have access to, and the first five points. <coughs> the reason it's not all the points is because they're using a standard multi-layer perceptron here, so there's, you know, it's a variable length, you know, A, and also you don't want it to be too big. Uh, there's a question. So the prefix is not fed into an RNN, it's just fed into a dense layer? Correct. Yep. So we just get 10 points concatenated together into a dense layer. So surprisingly simple. How good was it? Well. Um, look at the results. 214, 214, 213, 213, 213, 213, 213, 213, 213, 213, 213 211, or really 212. You know, everybody's clustered together. One person's a bit better at 208, and then way, way better at 203. And then they mentioned, by the way, in the paper, they didn't actually have time to finish training. So when they actually finished training, it was actually 1.87. Right, so they like they won so easily. It's not funny, 
And interestingly, in the paper, they actually mentioned the test set was so small that the only, they knew that the only way they could be sure to win was to make sure they won easily. Um, now, <clears throat> because the test set was so small, the leaderboard is actually not statistically that great. So they created a custom test set um, and tried to see if they could find something that's even better still on the custom test set. And it turns out that actually an RNN is better still. Um, it still would have won the competition, but um, just there's not enough data in the Kaggle test set that this is a statistically significant result. In this case, it is statistically significant. <coughs> um, a regular RNN wasn't better, but what they did instead was they said, um, let's take an RNN where we pass in five points at a time into the RNN, basically. Um, I think what probably would have been even better would be to have had a convolutional layer first and then pass that into an RNN. Um, they didn't try it, as far as I can see from the paper. Um, so, uh, and, and importantly, a bidirectional RNN, which ensures that the initial points and the last points tend to have more weight, because we know that RNNs, you know, their state generally reflects things they've seen more recently. So, um, so there's the result of this model. Um, so our um, poor, long-suffering intern Brad has been trying to replicate this result. Uh, he has had at least two all-nighters in the last two weeks, but hasn't quite managed to yet. So I'm not going to show you the code, but hopefully once Brad starts sleeping again, uh, he'll be able to finish it off and we can show you um, the notebook uh, during the week on the forum that actually um, uh, re-implements uh, this thing. Um, you know, it was an interesting process to watch Brad try to replicate this, you know, because <clears throat> the vast majority of the time, in my experience, when people say they've tried a model um, and the model didn't work out and they've given up on the model, it turns out that it's actually because they screwed something up, not because of the problem with the model. Um, and, and if you <clears throat> weren't comparing to Joshua Bengio's team's result, knowing that you haven't replicated it yet, you know, at which point do you give up and say, oh, my model's not working, versus saying, oh, no, I have, I've still got bugs? It's very difficult to debug um, machine learning models. So, um, you know, what Brad's actually had to end up doing is literally take the original Bengio team code, run it line by line, and then try to replicate it in Keras line by line and like literally np.org close every time. Um, because, you know, to build a model like this, it doesn't look that complex, but there's just so many places that you can make little mistakes. No. No normal person will make like zero mistakes. In fact, normal no, you know normal people like me will make dozens of mistakes. So when you build a model like this, you need to find a way to test every single line of code. Any line of code you don't test, I guarantee you'll end up with a bug, and you won't know you have a bug, and there's no way to ever find out you had a bug. Um, so yeah, did you have something, Rachel? So we have several questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, one is. I guess a note that uh, PI times CI is very similar to what happens in the memory network paper. In that case, the output embeddings are weighted by the attention probability. Vector. Yeah, or, or you know, it's a lot like a, a, a regular um, attentional um, um, language model. Yeah. Um, can you talk more about the idea you have about first having the convolutional layer and passing that to an RNN? What do you mean by that? So here is um, a fantastic paper. Um, which is, uh, I've still got it up. Um, I don't. Let me just find this paper. Oh, here it is. Yes. Um, you know, we looked at um, these uh, um, uh, kind of um, subword encodings last week uh, for language models. Um, I don't know if any of you thought about this and wondered, like, well, what if we just had um, individual characters? And uh, there's a really fascinating paper called Fully Character Level Machine Translation with no explicit segmentation. Um, it's from November of last year. And uh, they actually get fantastic results um, on just character level, <coughs> um, beating pretty much everything, including the BPE approach we saw last time. I'm just trying to find the results. Here we are. Um, yeah, so they looked at lots of different uh, approaches and, um, you know, 
comparing uh, BPE to um, individual character, and most of the time they got um, the best results. Their um, model um, looks like this, right? They start out with every individual character. It goes through a character embedding, just like we've used character embeddings lots of times. And then you take those character embeddings and you pass it through a one-dimensional convolution. <coughs> I don't know if you guys remember, but um, in, in part one of this course, um, Ben actually had a blog post about showing how you can do like multiple size convolutions and concatenate them all together. <clears throat> so you could use that approach, or you could just pick a single size, right? So you end up basically scrolling your convolutional window uh, across your sets of characters, and so you end up with the same number of convolution outputs as you started out with letters. Right, but they're now representing the information in a window around that letter. Right? Um, in this case, they then did max pooling. Right? So they basically said, okay, which window, um, assuming that you know, maybe we had a, a thing, so you can see they've got different sizes, a size 4, a size 3, and a size 5. Um, which bits you know, seem, to be, uh, seem to have got the highest activations around here, and then they took those max pooled things, and they put them through a second set of segment embeddings. They then put that through something called a highway network, which the details don't matter too much. It's kind of something like a, um, a dense net, like we learned about last week. Um, this is a slightly older approach than the dense net. And then finally, after doing all that, stick that through an RNN. Right? So the idea here in this model was they basically you know, did as much learnt pre-processing as possible and then finally put that into an RNN. And because we've got these max pooling layers, this RNN ends up with a lot less time points, <coughs> um, which is really important to minimize the amount of processing in the RNN. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail on this, but um, you know, <coughs> check out this paper because it's um, really interesting. Next question is, so for the destinations, we would have more air for the peripheral points. Are we taking a centroid of clusters? I don't understand that, sorry. Do you understand it? I mean, all we're doing is we're taking the softmax P multiplied by the cluster C, multiply them and add them up. I thought the first part was asking that with destinations that are more peripheral, peripheral they would have higher air because they would be harder to predict this way. Yeah, probably, which is fine because by definition, they're not close to a cluster center, so they're not common. So, yeah. And then going back, um, there was a question on the, the Rossman example. Um, what does MAPE with neural network mean? I would have expected that result to be the same. Why is it lower? No, this is just using a one-hot encoding without an, without an embedding layer. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Gosh, we kind of ran out of time a bit quickly, but I really want to show you this. Um, so quite a few of uh, the students and I have been trying to get um, a, a new approach to segmentation working, and um, I finally got it working in the last day or two, um, and I really wanted to show it to you. We talked last week about DenseNet, and I mentioned that DenseNet is like ass-kickingly good at doing image classification with a small number of data points, like crazily good. Um, uh, <clears throat> but I also mentioned that it's the basis of this thing called the 100 layers tiramisu, which is an approach to segmentation. So segmentation refers to taking a, um, a picture, um, a, a, an image, and figuring out you know, where's the tree, where's the dog, where's the bicycle, and so forth. So it seems like we're um, Joshua Bengio fans today, because this is uh, one of his uh, group's papers as well. Um, let me set the scene. So um, um, Brendan, uh, one of our students, who many of you have seen a lot of his blog posts, he has successfully got a PyTorch of this working, so I've uh, shared that on our files.fast.ai. And uh, I got the Keras version of it working. So I'll show you the Keras version because I actually understand it. Um, and if anybody's interested in asking questions about the PyTorch version, hopefully Brendan will be happy to um, answer them during the week. Um, 
So um, the data looks like this. There's an image, and then there's a. Um, let me show you. And then there's a labels. Okay, so that's basically um, what it looks like. So you can see here, you know, you've got traffic lights, you've got poles, you've got trees, buildings, footpaths, roads. Um, interestingly, the data set we're using is something called CamVid, and it's actually uh, the data set is actually frames from a video. Um, so a lot of the frames look very similar to each other. And there's only like um, 600 frames in total. So there's very, very little data um, in this CamVid data set. Furthermore, we're not going to do any pre-training. So we're going to try and build a state-of-the-art classification system on video, which is already much lower information content, because most of the frames are pretty similar, using just 600 frames without pre-training. Now, if you would ask me a month ago, I would have told you it's not possible. Um, like this just seems like an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, but just watch. So <clears throat> I'm going to skip to the answer first. Um, and here's an example of a particular frame we're trying to match. Um, here is the ground truth for that frame. So you can see there's a tiny car here and a little car here. So there are those little cars. There's a tree. You know, trees are really difficult, right? They're kind of incredibly fine, funny things. And here is my trained model. Um, and as you can see, it's done really, really well, right? Um, it's, it's interesting to look at the mistakes it made. Um, this little thing here is a person. But you can see that the person, it, kind of their head it looks a lot like traffic light and their jacket looks a lot like mailbox, you know. Whereas these tiny little people here, it's done perfectly, right? Or, oh, sorry, perfectly, yeah. Um, whereas this person, it got a little bit confused, right? Another example of where it's gone wrong is this should be a road, or else it wasn't quite sure what was road and what was footpath. Which makes sense, kind of the colors do look very similar, but had we have pre-trained something, <coughs> a pre-trained network would have understood that, you know, crossroads tend to go straight across, they don't tend to look like that, right? So you can kind of see the, sh you know, where the minor mistakes it made, it also would have learnt, had it looked at more than, you know, a couple of hundred examples of people, that people generally are a particular shape. Right? So there's just not enough data for it to have learned some of these things. But nonetheless, it is extraordinarily effective. You know, like look at um, this traffic light has kind of surrounded by a sign. So like the ground truth actually has the traffic light and then a tiny little edge of sign. And like it's even got that right. You know, so it's it's incredibly accurate model. Um, so how does it work? And in particular, how does it do these amazing trees? So the answer is um, in this picture. Um, basically, until um, uh, this is inspired by a model called UNET, right? Until the UNET model came along, um, everybody was doing these kinds of um, segmentation models using an approach just like what we did for style transfer, which was basically you have a um, number of um, convolutional layers with max pooling or with a stride of two, which gradually make the image smaller and smaller, bigger receptive field, and then you go back up the other side using upsampling or deconvolutions um, until you get back to the original size, and then your final layer is the same size as your starting layer um, and has a bunch of different classes that you're trying to use in the softmax. Um, <clears throat> the problem with that is that you end up with, um, in fact I'll show you an example, um, there's a really nice paper called um, ENET. Uh, ENET is um, not only an incredibly accurate model for segmentation, but it's also incredibly fast. It actually can run uh, in real time. You can actually run it on a video. Uh, but the mistakes it makes, look at this chair, right? This chair has a big gap here and here and here, but 
ANET gets it totally wrong, right? And the reason why is because they use a very traditional, you know, downsampling, upsampling approach. And by the time they get to the bottom, they've just lost track of the fine detail. So the trick are these connections here. What we do is we start with our input. We do a standard initial convolution, just like we did with style transfer. We then have a dense net block, right, which we learned about last week. And then that block, okay, then we keep going down, um, we do a max pooling type thing, another dense net block, max pooling type thing, keep going down. Um, and then as we go up the other side, so we do a, um, a, a deconvolution, dense block, deconvolution, dense block. We take the output from the dense block on the way down, so uh, and we actually copy it over to here and concatenate the two together, right? So actually, Brendan uh, a few days ago uh, actually drew this on our whiteboard um, when we were explaining it to Melissa, and so he's shown us every stage here. We start out with a 224 by 224. Uh, this is what Brendan thinks the tiramisu looks like. This, by the way, uh, 224 by 224 input. Uh, goes through the convolutions with 48 filters, goes through our dense block, adds another 80 filters. Uh, <clears throat> it then goes through our, they call it a transition down, so basically a max pooling. So it's now size 112, right? We keep doing that. Uh, dense block, transition down, so it's now 56 by 56, 28 by 28, 14 by 14, 7 by 7. And then on the way up again, we go transition up, it's now 14 by 14. We copy across the results of the 14 by 14 from the transition down and concatenate together. Then we do a dense block, transition up, it's now 28 by 28, so we copy across our 28 by 28 from the transition down, and so forth. So by the time we get all the way back up here, we're actually copying across um, something that was originally of size 224 by 224. It hadn't had much done to it, right? It had only been through um, one convolutional layer and one dense block, right? so it hadn't really got much rich computation being done. But the thing is, by the time it gets back up all the way up here, the model knows pretty much, you know, this is a tree and this is a person and this is a house, and it just needs to get the fine little details. You know, where exactly does this leaf finish? Where exactly does the person's hat finish? So it's basically copying across something which is very high resolution that doesn't have that much rich information, but that's fine because it really only needs to fill in the details. Right? So these things here, they're called skip connections. Right? And they were really um, inspired by this paper called UNET, um, which has been um, you know, won many Kaggle competitions. <coughs> but it's using dense blocks um, rather than normal fully connected blocks. Um, so let me show you. And you know we're not going to have time to go into this in detail, but um, I've, I've done all this code in Keras from scratch. This is actually like a fantastic fit for Keras. I didn't have to create any custom layers. I didn't really have to do anything weird at all. Um, oh, except for one thing: um, data augmentation. So the data augmentation was we start with um, 480 by 360 images. We randomly crop some 224 by 224 part. And also randomly we may flip it horizontally. That's all perfectly fine. Um, well, um, Keras doesn't really have the random crops, unfortunately. But more importantly, whatever we do to the input image, we also have to do to the target image. We need to get the first same 224 by 224 crop, and we need to do the same horizontal flip. So I had to write a, um, a data generator. Um, which you guys may actually find useful anyway. Um, so this is my data generator. Um, basically I called it a segment generator, um, and it's just a standard generator, so it's got a next function. right? Um, and each time you call next, it grabs some random bunch of indexes, um, it uh, goes through each one of those indexes and grabs the um, necessary item, grabbing a random slice, sometimes randomly flipping it horizontally, and then it's doing this to both the X's and for the Y's, um, returning them um, back. Um, along with this segment generator, in order to randomly grab, grab a, um, a batch of random indices each time, 
I created this little class called batch indices, which can basically do that, um, and it can uh, have either shuffle true or shuffle false. Um, so this um, this pair of classes you guys might find really helpful for creating your own data generators. Um, it, this batch indices class in particular, you know, now that I've written it, you can see how it works, right? Um, if I say batch indices from a, a data set of size 10, I want to grab three indices at a time. Um, so then let's grab five batches. Um, now in this case I've got by default shuffle equals false, so it just returns 012, 345, 678, 9, I'm finished, go back to the start, 012. Right? On the other hand, if I say shuffle equals true, it returns them in random order, but it still makes sure it captures all of them. Right? And then when we're done, it starts a new random order. Okay, so this makes it really easy to create um, random generators. So that was the only thing I had to add to Keras to get this all to work. Um, other than that, you know, we wrote the tiramisu, and the tiramisu looks very, very similar to the dense net that we saw last week, right? <coughs> We've got all our pieces, the ReLU, the dropout, the batch norm, the ReLU on top of batch norm, uh, a concat layer, so this is something I had to add, um, a convolution 2D followed by dropout, and then finally my batch norm followed by ReLU followed by convolution 2D. So this is just the dense block that we saw last week. Um, so a dense block is something where we just keep grabbing 12 or 16 filters at a time, concatenating them to the last set, and doing that um, a few times. That's what a dense block is. Um, so here's something interesting. The um, original paper um, for its um, down sampling, they call it transition down, um, did a, uh, um, a one by one convolution followed by a max pooling. <coughs> um, I actually discovered that doing a um, stride two convolution gives better results. Um, so you'll see I actually have not followed the paper. The, the one that's in comment, commented out here is what the paper did, um, but actually this works better. Um, so that was interesting. Um, interestingly though, on the um, transition up side, do you remember that checkerboard artifacts um, blog post we, we saw that showed that upsampling 2D followed by a convolutional layer works better? It does not work better for this. Um, in fact, a deconvolution works better for this. So that's why you can see I've got this deconvolution layer. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, uh, so basically, you can see when I go downsampling a bunch of times, it's basically do a dense block, and then I have to keep track of my skip connections, right? So I basically keep a list of all of those skip connections, right? So I've got to hang on to all of these. So every one of these skip connections I just stick in this little array, right? Appending them after every dense block, right? And so then I, I keep them all, and then I pass them to my upward path, right? So I basically do my transition up, and then I concatenate that with that skip connection, right? <clears throat> so that's the basic approach. Um, and so then the actual tiramisu model itself with those pieces is less than a screen of code, right? It's basically just do a 3x3 three three conv, do my down path, do my up path using those skip connections, um, then a 1x1 one one conv uh, at the end, um, uh, and a softmax. Okay? Um, so these dense nets, and indeed this, uh, this kind of a full, uh, fully convolutional dense net, or this um, tiramisu model, um, they actually take quite a long time to train. They don't have very many parameters, which is think why I think they work so well with these tiny data sets, but they do still take a long time to train. Uh, each epoch took a couple of minutes, um, and in the end I had to do you know, many hundreds of epochs. Um, and uh, you know, I was also doing a, you know, a bunch of learning rate annealing. So in the end this kind of really had to train overnight, even though I had only about five or six hundred frames. Um, but you know, in the end, <coughs> um, training, 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 training. Um, 
in the end, um, I got a really good result. Now, um, interest. I, I was a bit nervous at first. I was getting this like eighty-seven point six percent accuracy, um, but in the model, in the paper, they were getting getting ninety percent plus. It turns out that three percent of the pixels are um, marked as void. I don't know why they're marked as void, but in the paper, they actually remove them. So you'll see when you get to my results section, I've got this bit where I remove those void ones. And I ended up with 89.5%. Um, none of us in class managed to replicate the um, paper. The paper got 91.5% or 91.2%. Um, we tried the lasagna code they provided, we tried um, Brendan's PyTorch, um, we tried my Keras. Um, even though we couldn't replicate their result, um, this is still better than any other result I've found. So um, this is still, uh, you know, Super accurate. A um, <coughs> couple of quick notes about this. Um, first is they tried training uh, also on something called the GA Tech dataset, which is another video dataset. Um, the degree to which this is an amazing model is really clear here. Um, this seventy-six percent is from a model which is specifically built for video, so it actually includes the time component. Which is absolutely critical, and it uses a pre-trained network, so it's used like a million images to kind of pre-train, and it's still not as good as this model, right? So, like that is an extraordinary comparison. Um, this is the CamTech um, comparison. Here's the model we were just looking at, um, and again, um, I actually looked into this. I thought, oh, 91 and a half, whereas this one here, 88. Um, wow, it actually looks. Like it's not that much better. I'm really surprised. Uh, like even tree. Like I really thought it should win easily on tree, but it doesn't win by very much. So I actually went back and looked at this paper, and it turns out that the authors of the DenseNet paper. Um, this is the paper, by the way, multiscale uh, that they're comparison comparing to. Um, it turned out that they actually trained on crops of 852 by 852. Um, uh, so they actually used like a way higher resolution image to start with. So like you've got to be really careful when you read these comparisons. Sometimes like people actually kind of shoot themselves in the foot. So these guys were comparing their result to another model that was using like twice as big a picture. Um, so again, this is actually way better than they actually made it look like. Um, another one like this one here, this 88 also looks impressive. But then I looked across here, and I noticed that the dilution dilution eight model is like way better than this model on every single category, way better. And yet somehow the average is only 0.3 better. And then I realized, okay, this actually has to be an error, right? So this model is actually a lot better than um, this uh, this table gives the impression. Um, um, so um, I briefly mentioned that there's a model which doesn't have any skip connections called ENET, which is actually better than the tiramisu on everything except for tree. But on the tree, it's terrible. It's 77.8 versus oh, hang on, 37.3. That's not right. Uh, okay, I take that back. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was less good than this model, but now I can't find that data. Um, anyway, the reason I wanted to mention this is that um, uh, Eugenio um, is about to release a um, new model um, which uh, combines these approaches with skip connections. It's called LinkNet. Um, so you know, keep an eye on the forum because I'll be like looking into that um, quite shortly. Okay. Um, you got something, Rachel? So we have a few short questions, although I know we're almost out of time, so I don't know if you prefer yeah, to Yeah, let's, answer, let's them. answer them on the forum. Because, um, like, really, um, you know, I actually wanted to talk about this briefly. Um, a lot of you have come up to me and been like, oh, we're finishing, what do we do now? And the answer is, um, you know, we have now created a community 
of all of these people who have spent well over a hundred hours working on deep learning for many, many months, and have built your own boxes, and written blog posts, and you know, um, done all kinds of stuff. You know, set up um, social impact talks, um, um, written articles in Forbes. Uh, like, okay, this community is happening, right? So. It doesn't make any sense, in my opinion, for Rachel and I to now be saying, like, here's what happens next, right? So, um, just like you know, Elena has decided, okay, I want a book club. So she talked to Mindy, and we now have a book club, and in a couple of Monday's time, you can all come to the book club. Um, you know, so what's next, right? Well, you know, the forums will continue forever. Um, you know, we all know each other. Um, let's, like, do good shit, right? But most importantly, write code, right? Please write code. Um, write code, you know, build apps, um, take your work projects and try doing them with deep learning, you know, build libraries to make things easier, <clears throat> you know, maybe go back to stuff from part one of the course and look back and think like, oh, why didn't we do it this other way? Maybe I can make this simpler, you know. Um, write papers. Right, so um, I showed you that amazing result of the new style transfer approach from Vincent last week. Um, <clears throat> you know, hopefully that might turn into a paper. Um, write blog posts. In a few weeks' time, um, all the MOOC guys are going to be coming through and doing part two of the course. So, like, help them out on the forum. You know, teaching is the best way to learn yourself. Um, I I really want to hear the success stories, like. Um, People don't believe that what you've done is possible. Like I, I know that because, like, like as, as 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 recently as yesterday, there was you know the highest ranked Hacker News comment on a story about deep learning was about how like it's pointless trying to do deep learning unless you have years of mathematical background and you know C plus plus and you're an expert in machine learning techniques across the board, and otherwise there's no way that you're going to be able to do anything useful in any real world project. Uh, that, that today is what everybody believes, and we now know that's not true. Right? So um, Rachel and I um, are, are going to um, start up um, a podcast where we're going to try to um, both help uh, deep learning learners, um, but one of the key things we want to do is tell your stories. Right? So if, if you've done something interesting at work, or you've you know, got an interesting new result, or you're just in the middle of a project, it's kind of fun, please tell us, right? Um, either on the forum or private message or, or whatever, like, please tell us, because you know, we really want to share your story. And if it's not a story yet, you know, tell us enough that we can help you, you know, and, and that the community can help you. Um, <clears throat> you know, get, get together, you know, so you know, the book club, if you're watching this on the MOOC, you know, Organize other people in your geography to get together and, 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 and meet up or at your workplace. Like in this group here, I know we've got people from you know, Apple and Uber and Airbnb who started doing this in kind of lunchtime um, MOOC chats, and now they're, they're here at this course. Yes, Rachel? And I also wanted to recommend it would be great to start meetups to help lead other people through, say, part one of the course, um, kind of assist them going through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, Rachel and I really just want to spend the next six to 12 months focused on supporting your projects, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very interested in, you know, working, um, working on this, um, lung cancer stuff, but I'm also interested in like every project that you guys are working on, I, I want to help with that. Um, I also want to help people who want to teach this. So um, Yannette is going to go from being student to teacher, hopefully soon, and we'll be you know, teaching uh, USF students about deep learning, and hopefully uh, the next batch of people about deep learning. Anybody who's interested in teaching, you know, let us know, because this is the best high leverage activity, is to teach the teachers. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't know where, where this is going to end up, but my hope is really that, I mean, basically I would say the experiment has worked, you know, you guys are all here, 
your reading papers, your writing code, your understanding the most cutting-edge research level deep learning that exists today. Um, we've gone beyond some of the cutting-edge research in you know, many situations. Um, some of you have gone beyond the cutting-edge research. Um, so yeah, you know, let's build from here uh, as a community. And anything that Rachel and I can do to help, please tell us, because we just want you to be successful and we want the community to be successful. So um, yeah, one question. Uh, so will you be still active in the forums? Uh, very active. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that you know my job is to make you guys successful. Okay. So thank you all so much for coming and congratulations to all of you.